Welcome back to the Career Therapy Podcast, where we explore the intersection of work and well-being. I'm your host, Coach Marty, and each episode I interview mental health experts, coaches, and industry insiders to bring you practical insights and tips that will help you build a meaningful, rewarding, and sustainable career. So join me as we explore the path to career satisfaction, one conversation at a time. In today's episode, we sit down with Robin McKenzie, a licensed marriage and family therapist in Marin County, California, where she works with children, teens, adults, couples, and families. Together, we explore the role that personality plays in your career and how you can use free assessments like the Enneagram to better understand yourself, your motivations, and the strengths that you bring to your career. If you're enjoying the Career Therapy Podcast, please leave us a review on Spotify or iTunes and share this episode with someone you know who is struggling with their job search so we can help more people navigate their way to a better career. Thank you for tuning in. Now on to our conversation with Robin McKenzie. Hey, Robin, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to chat with you. Um, In our pre-work, we've been talking about, you know, personality types and work dynamics and how to figure out setting boundaries with bosses and all sorts of really cool stuff that I can't wait to get into our conversation today with you. Uh, As we kick things off, I'd love for you to just give us a little bit of your background and what brought you to the work that you're doing today. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here too. Um, So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapy here in California, and I work in the North Bay area. Um, And what brought me to therapy? I mean, I think it's actually kind of interesting because my original interest in becoming a therapy started kind of at the end of my time in college. And then I worked in a number of different offices for a while and sort of having different experiences in workplace dynamics and seeing kind of needs and sort of becoming a person that a lot of people would come talk to. And I was like, this is fascinating. I love learning more about people. And this is kind of interesting that I'm finding myself in all these conversations Um, really actually kind of directed me into wanting to become a therapist and really, you know, finding my passion for this type of work. And I also, you know, in my course of like my master's studies and my master's thesis was doing a lot of research on workplace dynamics and like, you know, what does it mean to use management, uh, empathy as a management tool, actually, just kind of seeing that maybe not be present in some workplaces and then also how it was really effective when it was present in certain places that I was working to. So that's just like a little brief background for me. (laughs) And then I've been in private practice for um, two years now and worked with a startup for a little bit before that, and then spent the first seven years of my career in more of a community mental health setting, working with um, teens and their families and um, kind of more of a school-based environment. I love that. And there's so much from these worlds um, that overlap. You know, when people hear licensed marriage and family therapists, they think the family, right? Um, But it really, I think in a lot of ways, when I talk to different therapists, it kind of comes down to relationships, right? Our, Our relationships with others, our relationships with ourselves, how those things you know, conflict or work well together, depending on what's happening. And uh, as you think about, um, let's just kind of start with that relationship with ourselves, because today we're going to talk about personality tests and and, and how personality shows up in our work. Um, so what are you seeing with the clients that you've worked with over the years when it comes to our personality, or at least maybe we take it a little broader, our relationship with ourselves, where do things tend to go off the rails? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I I think it's, it is such a complicated one too, because it can happen in so many ways. And I, I think you brought up a really good point of what is it like for us, even at the beginning of, do we feel like we're aligned with our family or not. And I think that's sort of a direct comparison to any, you know, relationship that we're in, you know, romantic or friendship, 
you know, how we grow in our relationships with our families, and then the line of work that we choose, the workplace that we're in, all of that. Like, do we feel like our specific personality traits, our strengths, our challenges are aligned with that place? Do we feel like we're appreciated and then also appropriately challenged? Or do we feel like we're being attacked or shamed or, you know, ostracized? Like all of those things really just kind of like shape whether or not we're feeling like confident in ourselves at the core. And I feel like it's that space of us being able to go, you know, this is a really hard environment for me, but I recognize that it's not a good fit versus like if we're really misaligned kind of on all levels, we can really kind of direct that inward toward ourselves of being, I'm not good enough. I must be doing something wrong because this isn't going well. And really it's like, we're, especially in a therapy space, we're wanting to get to that place where we're able to recognize our strengths and our challenges and go, Hey, is this actually a good fit for me? You know, are there things that I can modify or is it just that, huh? Like I'm allowed to leave if I want to, I'm allowed to have this not be a good place. And it's not that I'm bad. It's not that I've done something wrong or there's some kind of fundamental flaw in me, which I think oftentimes that's the place that we can go is that really deep self blame and thinking that we have to be someone different than we are. Yeah. And I think it's something that's fostered in the way that careers are developed in the way that the education system is maybe designed in the way that family dynamics play out. Right. Because You know, when I talk to folks and they get into that, I'm not good, you know, I always take this kind of funny way to look at it, which is these companies aren't good. Like these companies are just a bunch of people as messy as us running around with their hair on fire, trying like the reason that they post to this job is because they're failing in some way, shape or form. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not this like perfect entity as nice as they look on the internet. They're not this perfect entity that's like bestowing a job upon you. Right. They're a mess. And you're probably better than you're giving yourself credit. And so I try to like even those scales out just slightly, Mm -hmm. but it is a very difficult thing for us to do, especially when that idea of I'm not good enough has been ingrained for so many years. And I think it's so great that you're talking about like the family relationship, because a lot of people I'll talk to, they chose their career because that's what their family pushed them into or And then, you know, wake up at 35 or 40 and be like, what am I even doing? This isn't even what I chose. Um, Or um, you'll have someone who is replaying, you know, childhood family dynamics in their work, in uh, relationships, in their sort of like, you know, they haven't reparented themselves or whatever the thing might be. And and now they're kind of treating their boss with the same energy that they had as a kid. Um, And these power dynamics kind of show up in really interesting ways as we work with people because um, it can prevent people from moving up in companies. Uh, You know, in my case, it played out early in my career with me just like leaving jobs and because my way is to sort of like detach and just be like, well, I'm not going to put up with this. And so I'm out. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, trying to figure all of that out, it's I think it's a tough thing for people because how do you figure that out while also maintaining a career right because i think you know there's like the let's go just be a monk and figure things out for Mm -hmm. years or let's just bury everything and succeed and that middle ground is messy right where you're working on yourself but also trying to like do your day-to-day life how have you seen people navigate the the messy in between yeah i mean i think all sorts of ways and i think the kind of the biggest thing that i focus on when we're in that zone is like really trying to combine the practical with that like deeper self-exploration because I think you're right and I think a lot of common like self-care rhetoric right now tells us like you have to go take a break go be a monk go on a vacation go get space you know get out of that toxic job all of that that all sounds great I don't I don't think anything about that sounds bad I'd love to do that myself in many ways sometimes (laughs) like awesome But we also have to be realistic about where people are. Like, is it actually a reality for you to leave your job? It might not be. That might have dire circumstances for you and your family. And so part of this feeling of being trapped, the answer is not going to come from, you just have to leave that toxic environment right now. And, you know, I think that also we were talking about the messy middle of it all, of a lot of grace, a lot of grace with yourself. And 
Um, one of the phrases that I use a lot in my practice and with my clients is like experimentation, that it's like, we're constantly doing experiments versus I think sometimes we have this pressure of like, if I'm trying something new, it has to go well, if not perfect. Otherwise I did it wrong. As opposed to you're always trying to experiment. What does a boundary coming out feel like for you? How does that person receive it and react? You're always gathering data. You're always gathering information. And when you're in the experiment phase, it's going to feel messy. It's going to feel bad at times. And how do we give ourselves grace and our own boundaries of like, well, if if the pri- if the priority here is I just can't lose my job, I must have a paycheck. We're going to have a different boundary and a different way of evaluating and experimenting than I really don't want to leave, but I will if it reaches X point or if the experiments go this way, then I'll go. You know, we're always kind of tailoring it to what works for that individual person and, and trying to help with normalizing that you're doing something different. It's going to feel uncomfortable at, I think, best and really bad and awkward and possibly like a worse than when you first started <laughs> you're like I already thought it was bad and now I've just made it worse like it, it can go that way sometimes on that healing journey but all of that is is normal and really trying to kind of normalize that build resilience build that you know really grace in that process to take risks and see what happens yeah and it's you know we have life responsibilities right we can't just or learn something about ourselves and detach from the whole thing. So as we get into this, there's multiple areas that I want to dig into. The you know we talk about boundaries here, and and a lot of what we're going to talk about in today's conversation, I think, is going to come back to boundaries. Um, but everyone has different boundaries, and so um, one of the things that I find so interesting about career advice or just advice on the internet in general is that you know, you'll take something that worked for you, right? Or that worked for a client or, you know, depending on how bad the YouTube channel is, they'll just start qu- quoting random crap, but um, <laughs> they'll they'll just take a small idea and make it ubiquitous for everyone. They'll say, you know, everyone should X, everyone should quit their job. Everyone should not go to college. Everyone should start a business. Everyone is creative. Like, yeah. Sure, everyone's creative, but not everyone's an artist. So like, chill out with the way you're yeah. talking about these things, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, um, you know, I, I always resisted that as I was kind of coming up over the years, because I would see people be like, we are the anti-college brand. And they would like, try to encourage people to quit college or quit their job or different things like that. And I'm just like, you don't know who you're talking to, right? Exactly. And so a lot of what we're we're, you know, when we give advice on these podcasts and things like that, or just generally putting anything out on the internet, it's always going to be a little bit more binary and one-sided than it mm-hmm. needs to be. And so what I'm hoping people can do is utilize personality tests or utilize any of these tools that are out there in order to be able to find their filter for information. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so as you've been using personality tests with people, you know, there's a lot of issues with personality tests that you can come across when you do research from the bias that's in it to companies utilizing it to like hurt people or like use people. Right. Um, I remember I took strengths finders at one of my jobs and I was like, none of my strengths are my job. Should I change jobs? And they're like, what? No, we just paid for that seminar, go back to work. Mm-hmm. And so like, we kind of have to take it upon ourselves. It's our responsibility to understand it and to apply mm-hmm. it. So what personality tests have you utilized with clients and how have you seen it impact them? Absolutely. I I think that you're making such an important point. It's a point that I really like to make a lot because you're right. There is no one size fits all. And I find in my practice, I usually just go to Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or if my client is bringing something up because you're right, there's so much out there. I mean, social media, on YouTube, I, kind of anywhere you can find something that says, hey, you might be this person. And either someone really connects to that or really rejects that. And so I don't usually lead with going like, hey, I want you to go like take this Enneagram quiz. Um, I will sometimes if we're talking about it a ton and they haven't heard of it yet. And I'm like, you know, I think this actually might be a helpful place to jump off from. And that's always what it is, is it's a tool to help us find resonance, to help us 
look at words that are common to other people's experience and see what lands for us. And I think it's it's almost a really freeing exercise in take what fits, let go of what doesn't. You don't have to look at this and be, well, I'm not every single thing on this list, so I must not be X. Or I look at that person's list and I wish I was that. And so what does that mean about me? It's more of how do I get that insight and empathy with myself? How do I maybe better understand my dynamics with other people who are around me? And how do I use this tool with flexibility? Like the purpose of this tool is how does it bring us insight, context, better understanding, and then better functioning in our own life? If you're using something in your workplace with a therapist, like anywhere, and you're like, wow, this just doesn't feel good. I don't feel like I connect to this. I'm always feeling like I'm not good enough when I'm leaving this space. I'm always wishing I was something different. It's probably not the right tool to use. And it is okay to let that go. I think we have such a push through mentality, which can be really helpful when we're building resilience, but it can also really harm us when we're like, so I have to take everything and always push through. And if I have any bad feeling about it, it means there's something wrong wrong with me and I'm not tough enough. Or like, I just can't handle the truth about myself as opposed to, I think you probably know yourself. And then if you're working with a therapist, you can have some great deep conversations of, well, what's the resistance coming up here? Is it that I actually am ignoring something that's really hard for me to accept about myself? Or is this something that like, yeah, this probably isn't the right fit for you and let's find something different. So I think, you know, that's just a really key thing to keep in mind. And it's also a big part of the reason why my practice and, you know, my background is really focused in like client centered therapy that like, I like my clients to take the lead because I can bring my lens to be useful but I don't want to be directing people in that way of like, oh, this is a tool that's out there that a lot of workplaces use or a lot of people use. And so it's going to fit for you. It's like, well, let's let's experiment. Let's try this out, see where it lands and take it or leave it. And so that's, yeah. that's usually how I like to approach it. And it's interesting because it it totally changes over time, usually based on what's like in popular knowledge, because that's what that's what my clients are connecting to. I'm not going to go into the archives and bring out some like yeah, ancient yeah. psychology class that they're like, cool, but I actually read this great article on this thing. And I'm pretty convinced that like, I'm that. So that's not really helpful to me. It's like, right. let's go for it. Let's use the lens and see what happens. I love that. And it's it's also one of those things where I, I try to meet my clients where they're at. Like if they love astrology, you know, it's not my thing, but if it gives you a language to talk about things that mm-hmm. you're experiencing, let's let's start there, you know? Exactly. And I think so much of of what we're just trying to do here is have language around these things because I don't think it's taught very well in our society, our education systems, mm-hmm. our family units, like how to not only like feel what we're feeling, like actually be experience what we're experiencing, but also communicate that either just to ourselves, like in a journal or to other Mm -hmm. people when it comes to setting boundaries and things like that. And so when we do something like the Myers-Briggs or or the Enneagram, and I've used both in my coaching, I do find Myers-Briggs tends to confuse people a little more just because some of the language is, you know, introvert, extrovert carries so much baggage and that's not quite what it means with the test and, you know, all that different Mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas like when I've switched to the Enneagram, people are having much let's just say visceral reactions and uh, utilizing it in more active ways versus just kind of be like, yes. okay, well, that's a thing. They're like, wait, okay, that's a thing. <laughs> you know, And so, yeah. and I've even seen it in myself as well. Um, mm-hmm. And I do think that one of the things that's so interesting with the Enneagram, and we can break down what it is in just a second, is that um, it sort of calls out what you look like under stress and what you look like in an average situation and what you could look like in a healthy situation. And when we think about it in those terms, I think it's, I think we all sort of want to be a static thing. Like whenever I talk to people, they're like, I need a static professional brand, static personal brand. I need to have a job that never changes. I need, like, we're trying so hard to just be a thing, right? You know, oh, I took this job or I started this hobby and now that has to be me. And we can do that with personality tests where we're like, I am a thing, but it's like, we're actually all the things. It's just, this is the most prevalent. Yes. Um, Yes. 
And I think what ends up happening when we can look at it and integrate it in a healthy way, we can just start saying like, they can almost build a little bit more acceptance rather than sometimes you take a personality test and you start beating yourself up more. Whereas I think mm-hmm. the whole point of doing this work is to take it, maybe learn something, accept your reality more and then work with it. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause what ends up, what ends up causing so many problems in people's careers is that they're trying to have a career that doesn't fit with how they think. And so Mm -hmm. your parents told you you need to be X. And so you've been like grinding at that, but it's just like, why am I not moving up? Why am I not moving forward? Well, maybe it's not the work that comes Mm -hmm. naturally to you or the environment that feels comfortable to you. I was talking with someone earlier today and she was saying she's been in like the, a very male dominated field her whole life. And she's like, I don't know if I actually want to keep fighting this, this type of environment maybe there's something yeah. better out there and we haven't started our work together yet but we'll see where that goes where that thought takes her um maybe she mm-hmm. stays there and just finds a uh, you know a way to navigate it maybe she makes a big a big change but mm-hmm. when we think about how do, how these personality types show up can you maybe just give your interpretation of the enneagram and we can, I, I want to go through all the types. I don't know if that's going to be helpful in this podcast to just literally <laughs> talk through nine different types and, and all the different things, but maybe just give your high level understanding of how the Enneagram works and how you've seen it show up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think you did a great job actually kind of giving that summary of like strengths under stress and kind of at, at like a baseline. Um, and I think that's what I like. And I also like that it's slightly different depending on what kind of resource you use. So I like have a few different websites that I like. And I also have like a particular Instagram account that I like, and it's allowed to be, it's my preference. And it's what speaks to me as a provider and me as a person. And I think it's a great jumping off point of it's just like clear. And it gives a lot of examples of character traits, feelings, things like that. And that's usually what I'm looking for, especially in my work with my clients is I want to give examples. I want to give a place to jump up from. And because usually it's like, we're not thinking and feeling, you know, we're not thinking in those feeling words. We're going my body, my brain, like something is off and I have a pretty limited emotional vocabulary. If, you know, I haven't done a ton of that, like therapeutic work, or I'm not really drawn to that, or I'm not really a touchy feely person. Like you're going to have a pretty limited emotional vocabulary and these things are going to come up for you. And you're going to go, I I don't know. I just, it just feels bad. It just feels weird, like something. And so we're really looking for those words to stand out of like, let's connect, let's explore these things and see like, does this resonate? Like, and then where can we go from there with that knowledge? Um, In my own practice, I think it's really interesting. Like as I was doing the reflecting coming, you know, coming up with different like themes that I'm noticing and prepping for this space, you know, I really started to notice, like, I have a lot of ones, twos, threes, and eights in my practice. And I was like, that is super interesting (laughs) that it's like those particular types. And, you know, we can come up, I'm sure with a variety of different reasons why that is. But one that stuck out to me that I think um, is probably the most accurate is that I'm mostly a talk-based therapist. Like that's how I work best. I work really well with clients who like to verbally process, who want to have someone that they're more in conversation with. We're bouncing things off. We're exploring things. And it is done in a more verbal way. That's actually going to really speak more to like ones, twos, threes, and eights who are more in that kind of um, either achievement zone, helper zone, you know, the, like the doer zone or, you know, having these accomplishments, like that's going to be a good combination of that reflection, but also having that practical space to have things to do. Even if the thing to do is practice acceptance of who you are and thinking about how to kind of move forward with that. So I'm going to pause there for a second because I'm not sure if I'm totally answering your question. So I want to see. If no, you're doing great. So there another. Okay. No, because we're not going to be able to go into every type today. I think that would be just too much for one podcast. And maybe there's some follow-ups we can do to go into each type. But totally. just to kind of hit on those types that you called out. So 
the one type is the perfectionist. Mm -hmm. The two type is the giver, the helper. Mm -hmm. Um, you had mentioned threes and eights. So the three is the achiever mm -hmm. and eight is the challenger. So we can almost say like maybe one of the reasons you're working with these types, if we think about it, um, you know, if you're trying to achieve, <laughs> if you're trying to help people, if you're trying to, you know, be a perfectionist, that's going to draw you to seek out help, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And some types that are maybe that lean more avoidant, uh, who maybe like a seven, which mm -hmm. is, uh, what would they call the seven? It's the enthusiast. enthusiast. A seven mm -hmm. doesn't like to necessarily sit with the negative emotions. So they might go off and, mm -hmm. and, and avoid <laughs> dealing with these things head on necessarily, mm -hmm. um, unless pushed to it through a, right. a series of, of situations. And so, um, when I think about these things, um, so much of what we're trying to do is we think about our personality and I recommend everyone go take one of these tests. I personally like to use truity.com. Just know that when you get to the end of the test, it's like a little bit confusing where your results are. There's like a chart and a paragraph that's like, they're going to try and upsell you, but the answer is there. Um, <laughs> but when you, when you take these tests and you go to something like personality junkie and you read up on these things, it's it's not just, oh, I'm this thing, but it's like really digging in and saying like, what does that mean for the work that I'm doing, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. there's this prescription on the internet that everyone should be ambitious. Everyone needs to be a business owner. Everyone mm -hmm. needs to make a million dollars. If you're not, you know, like how many like six figure coaches exist? Like how many, <laughs> all these different things. And yeah. I think, you know, when, when you're in a space like yours or mine, where we highlight the word therapy, it's going to pull out maybe more of the heart types or different things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, everyone has their own um, sort of needs. And I think what ends up happening is what we can see with these personality tests is we can see where our reactions are not in alignment with reality yes so let's you know i'm personally and i i don't know if you feel comfortable sharing your type but i'm a four mm -hmm. and so fours uh i think when i i used to test as a nine which apparently is an a common thing for a four mm -hmm. <laughs> who, ah, who, doesn't, yeah. who doesn't like want to admit certain things about themselves i guess <laughs> um and again these tests are not scientific and so depending on where you're at in your life you might test wrong right. um but i remember in like 20 15 I was chatting with one of my friends and they were like I think you're a four and I was like I don't know I don't know what I am I don't know what this test is I don't know what it is mm -hmm. and uh and it's funny like so many years later uh I'm a four and he's a four and you know there's this sort of um the thing that really kind of kicked me uh was the it, it started giving out like little cliches right a cliche thing that a four does is post a bunch of creative things on the internet and then delete their social media presence and when I read that, I was like, I've done that so many times. And I actually had that urge to do that again this week. I was mm -hmm. like, I should just delete all my social channels. And I'm like, why do I keep doing this? <laughs> why do mm -hmm. I keep going through these yeah. cycles? And so mm -hmm. what it's helped me do is identify the cycle. And mm -hmm. I was already doing that in a variety of different ways prior to taking the test and prior to really digging into my my type deeply. And I think a lot of people will find that as they take this test, it'll just sort of help them have like little mini epiphanies that they've already been noticing. Yes. Just mm -hmm. more, again, putting language around it. Yes, exactly. And so um, for me, it's like, okay, I'm seeing the cycle. I'm mm -hmm. burnt out and then I do this and then I do that to feel better. And then I do this and then I maybe run away in this way or maybe I mm -hmm. try to reach out in this way and then I feel rejected in this way and mm -hmm. that'll show up at work or in a relationship. And, and then you can start to go, okay, when that's happening, what do I do? Do I mm -hmm. lean on my bad coping mechanisms? Do I lean on my good coping mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Do I reach out to someone? What do I do? And so mm -hmm. as you've been working with people and helping them identify their types and, and apply this information, mm -hmm. what are some examples? Maybe you can share a type that you worked with and an example of a, of a behavior that they were able to catch and maybe 
better manage, not necessarily change because we don't really change right. mm -hmm. at our core, right. but how do we better manage ourselves and our personality? Yeah. Absolutely. I I love that language too of like, it helps us recognize the cycle. Like it gives us that context. It gives us that translation of what's happening as opposed to, I think you phrased it so well of like, oh my gosh, why do I do that? Like I'm kind of called out by something. And then why do I do that? And if we get stuck on the why, that's usually a direct pathway into shame and either like avoiding or really overcompensating in a way that's going to kind of lead us back to the same behaviors because we're going to be like, well, I tried something totally different and it didn't work. And we get stuck. We get stuck in the why as opposed to, oh, I am doing this, period. Like th this is happening. This is part of the cycle. Where do I have choices? Where is it that I usually go? And how does that usually turn out for me? And, you know, are there things that I would like to try out to do differently? And I think to me, that's such a more freeing way of thinking about it, as opposed to that there's some sort of like mystery we have to unlock in ourselves to be this like best or preferred self all the time, as opposed to it's like, we're all, we're all going to ebb and flow. We're all going to like lean into the things that we don't love that we do. And we're all going to like have those opportunities to find success in doing something differently. And that's great. And so I think um, it's interesting. One of the examples that I'll use is from one of my twos. And that's probably because like, I'm, I'm a two, I'm a very strong, like two wing one. And like, I think in my younger self, I was actually much more of a one, like, and, and I've like sort of leaned into those strengths of the two side. Whereas again, that older version of myself, I think found those really threatening or like really. And to just, to just them. quickly interject. Mm -hmm. So the two is the giver or the helper. I think the yes. cliche around that would be like a nurse or someone yes. in a helping mm -hmm. field or a therapist. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then a one is the perfectionist. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all sorts of, and I encourage anyone who's interested to go deeper into this and like, look at the wings and how yes. we totally. go to certain types and stress mm -hmm. and things like that. But just kind of broadly speaking, you're in the giver role. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you get validated by helping people. Yes. And when maybe you're stressed out or maybe when you're not in a, you're, you kind of go to that perfectionist. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's like twos can often go into either one of their wings, like, you know, if you're stressed, or oftentimes we go to an eight. So it goes to the, you know, maybe some the challenger. And more of that, you know, we think of that as being more like aggressive or twos oftentimes can be very manipulative, like in that space, that it's like, those are the kinds of like, we're panicked, we're stressed out, we're not sure what to do. And so we're leaning on some of those traits to compensate for that. And so I think it is a really interesting dynamic between kind of like the challenger and the giver and like, where do we like reach? And then the same thing with like, you know, where does per the perfectionist part come in of like, okay, am I going like all back to like order and expecting really high things from myself and everyone else? And, you know, it, it, it's all of those things that I think um, it's important to think about those two as like strengths, but how do they serve us? Because they're like any trait can be a strength in certain ways. Well, maybe not any, we won't go that far, but lots of <laughs> things, you know, even things we don't like about ourselves can actually be strengths, but it really is the question of how does it serve us in that situation or how does it serve us in the moment? And sometimes something that really got us through, maybe like through a stressful work situation or a difficult time of our life, you know, doesn't really stay with us as something that helps us anymore and actually keeps getting in our way. And so that's when it's like, you know, you're able to feel like you're taking more of that accurate test and you're like, oh yeah, this is feeling really connected to who I am. And it's nice to feel settled in that. And like, I'm not having to use all of these different tools that maybe don't fit for me anymore, or maybe don't actually work for me that well. It's not getting me what I need, but it's an old tool that I'm used to using. So I keep grabbing for it. Right. Um, and so I, I think one thing that uh, comes up for me in terms of like um, an example of like work that I've done, and this revolves around boundaries a lot, is kind of that core need of twos in a lot of ways. Again, the more stereotypical things that we think about when we use the types is that core need to be loved or, you know, to be needed or to be helpful, you know, all of those things. And really, we see that as like, you're right nurses, therapists, like the help, the helping professions. And 
people who feel enriched by their work because they feel like they're doing something good in the world. And a lot of times we see those types feel really good at work, not necessarily because they have these outside achievements or titles or anything like that, but it's oftentimes when they feel connected to their teams and connected to management, and they also feel appreciated. And usually that's going to happen verbally. Like for a two at work, it's like just telling them that they're doing a great job or telling them that you see them and you appreciate them. That is going to make so much of a difference and be like much more meaningful than some of the other incentives that'll work for other types. And one thing though, that can be really problematic is that twos can really lean into people pleasing and totally ignoring their own needs and being like the classic, like I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. As they are like hurtling towards burnout because they're always taking care of other people. And they're like, well, that person's stressed. And it's not stopping to think, well, also, are you stressed? Like if they're feeling stressed, you might also feel that way. And you're also allowed to have that need and experience. Um, we often see twos like functioning in that way of like the classic, like giving 120% or starting a job and being like, I'm just so grateful to be here that they're going above and beyond all the time and not even thinking about how do I set reasonable expectations here? How do I set boundaries here? And they get stuck usually a few months in with like, oh no, well, I have to like set a boundary with someone, but I haven't been doing that this whole time. And so now setting a boundary is going to feel daunting usually to a two anyways, but even, now it feels even more impossible of like, well, I'm letting them down. They expect this of me. I'm so helpful. Like I can't let them down in this way. And so with, you know, a particular client of mine, like there was a lot of difficulty with their boss and this space of feeling like their boss didn't like them. And so this was like a huge, huge crisis and was also, like we talked about before, connection to family, bringing up a lot of feelings from childhood too. And like family dynamics, how did I feel in my own family of origin, like that kind of stuff too. And the default was always people, please. Always take care of it, pre-predict the needs, don't have to be asked anything, you know, don't let anybody know if something is going wrong, like just take care of it yourself. And so this person is doing all of this, like feeling incredibly burned out also, but sitting here with this dilemma of this doesn't feel good. This feels awful, but my boss doesn't like me. How am I supposed to like be able to ask for anything for myself if this person doesn't like me? And, you know, really having to like do that work of breaking down of like, well, what does that mean? They don't like you. How are you getting that information from them? You know, and also what does that mean to not be allowed to set a boundary if someone doesn't like you? Like, I mean, your boundary is not really for them. Your boundary is for you, but that's a very scary thing for a two as well of like, well, that's going to push me farther away. That's my biggest fear is not feeling loved. My biggest fear is not feeling accepted in that way. And that's going to push me even farther away. I already feel that way. I'm doing all of the things I can think to do to earn that love and earn that acceptance and it's not working. So what am I supposed to do when I'm in a career that I'm feeling completely burned out in now and I'm terrified to talk to my boss? And so it's a lot, lot, lot of coaching in, you know, what are our automatic assumptions that are coming up? What does it mean to be liked? What does it mean also to deserve respect? and deserve a certain level of acceptance without having to earn it. I think that's a big one too, when we're talking about people pleasing of like, kind of forgetting that there is just this baseline level, no matter where you are, that it's like, it's okay to ask for that yeah. period, because you're a human being in a workplace. <laughs> like you're totally. allowed to do that no matter what your boss or anybody else thinks of you. And so I think like, that's, that's a really important and like delicate space and, and sort of going through, I think, then a lot of examples of how to set boundaries, because when we don't have the language of boundaries, when we're not a type that feels comfortable setting boundaries, the language of confrontation can feel so inaccessible. Or like you were mentioning before, you know, the advice that's out on the internet can be very like one size fits all. And they're like, well, I can't say that. So I'm not a person who's able to say X. So that means I can't do this as opposed to, well, how do we put that in your language? And how do we maybe set a boundary that is, feels more curious and you're allowed to just say, you know, that doesn't feel good to me. I'm curious how we can work toward this so I can take that day off or I can give that project to someone else. Or even like, 
hey, you're going to have to let that part of the job go because you're going above and beyond. Like technically you shouldn't be doing that anyways. I know you're getting praise for doing it. I know everyone loves that you're doing it, but it's really burning you out and you're going to have to stop doing it and letting them just feel that pain. And instead of taking it personally, when they notice it's going undone and they're like, what's happened? How is somebody letting this like fall apart? Instead of taking that as a personal attack and going, I failed, they're rejecting me. Remind yourself, oh wait, how do I speak up and say, well, actually that's something that I've been doing, but a goal of mine is to, you know, abide by my work hours. And so I'm not actually able to get this done in my work hours because I've added this project here. Like, and it's really a lot about slowing down reactions and slowing down the fear that comes up to try to fix it of like, oh, well, they said the thing and now I don't know what to do. And so it's a lot of that coaching, a lot of that language building and a lot of really checking to see like, does this actually feel comfortable coming out of your mouth? Because the last thing I want to do is be like suggesting that my clients say something. They're like, I would never say that. Because like, well, and that's and that's the issue, right? Because mm-hmm. so you know, someone will come to me, and a lot of unfortunately, a lot of the job search is here's how you conform to the yes. process of the job search. Mm-hmm. It's not really about being a unique individual, although there's ways that we can leverage your uniqueness in the job search mm-hmm. in order to find things that are right for you. And obviously, we need to figure out what's unique about us in order to feel good about ourselves throughout the process. But when we actually go talk to a company it's not really about us. It's about the company. And a lot of what you're saying here is like, it's, it's about uh, controlling those knee jerk reactions and putting some space. And then not only can like understanding the knee jerk reaction, but like, okay, this is, this is the reaction that I'm having. I typically do these things in response to them very quickly without thinking. Mm -hmm. If I stop and pause, is there another way that I can adjust my response, even though I know that like give authenticity to the reaction, but -hmm. is there a way that I can adjust things to get a better reaction? So a good example of this, I was working with someone and they ended up uh, as a, a two as well. Um, I think twos are very common in our work, um, especially because they get burnt out so easily. And again, the twos are those helpers. Uh, This person was not in a like helper role. They were, I mean, I guess in a, in a technical way they are, Uh, they're in project management, but they're not in like the, the cliche tradition, like Mm -hmm. the, what we've been talking about. But if you, if you think about it, um, what they were struggling with was networking and everyone struggles with networking. Yeah. And I think a lot of the internet advice is just go do it. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. just go network. And that's like yeah. what I grew up with. It was like, mm-hmm. I was a massive introvert. I wanted, you know, I had all sorts of insecurities and mm-hmm. my, the advice I received was, you know, grit your teeth and go do it and like, go embarrass your, and basically the way I figured it out was just, I went and had so many embarrassing conversations that eventually I got like inoculated to it. <laughs> and now I can like do podcasts <laughs> But that was a painful process to right. like go through yeah. versus yeah. if I had understood early on what drives me, what makes me feel energized and what drains me, mm-hmm. I could maybe have like gone about it in a way that was a little bit less painful, let's say. Yes. And so in this case in particular, um, the person was a two and they were like, I've never had a problem networking my whole career. I've never had a problem, but I can't do it. I can't send the email. Like, I just can't send the email, like to the point of having a breakdown. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we finally, after, you know, many weeks of, of working on, on like different, you know, tactics, I was like, you could try this tactic or that tactic, but they were just like, not, not able to get over that mental barrier. Right. Um, We took the Enneagram and they realized that the reason that they don't want to network is because when they had a job, they had something to give they had advice to give or opportunities Mm -hmm. to give they felt like they were bringing something to the conversation when they didn't have the job they felt like they were taking in the conversation they felt like a burden they felt like they were asking for something Mm -hmm. and they had nothing to give Mm -hmm. and therefore they didn't want to bother anyone and so we had this like really intense call where they sort of realized like this is showing up in all sorts of different areas of their life and and so on and so forth. And we, we kind of dug down and said, well, there are ways to give 
even when you don't have a job. Like just because you don't have a job doesn't mean you're incapable of giving anything, whether that's a compliment or whether that's uh, joining a professional organization and helping run the events. And then you're giving in a, in a very formal way or an informal way. And they have this like full on, like difficult epiphany, but, but an epiphany nonetheless. And, you know, a few weeks later, they finally messaged me and they said, I finally got over my fear of bothering people, reached out to a good friend and they responded right away and were happy to refer me to a job. Let's go. Yes. And that's the kind of stuff where it's like, when we can understand this mm -hmm. and accept it, not understand it and then beat ourselves up about it, right? Because you could say, well, I, I I guess I am I am a helper and I can't help. And now I'm going to go deeper into my pit. Right, right. It's like, no, I'm a helper. Okay. I need to find ways to help. So it's not, I need to network. Yes. It's mm -hmm. I need to find ways to help. And the truth is, is that the whole job search is just helping companies. Companies yeah. suck. They're mm -hmm. full of people that don't know what they're doing and they're hiring because they're in pain or they, they have a problem. And your role is literally I'm helping this company fix this thing. And so yes. you could shift your entire perspective on the job mm -hmm. search to mm -hmm. I'm here to help, not I need a job. And it switches you from desperation to helping and exactly. so these are the things that i'm i'm hoping people can start to like dig into and mm -hmm. and really think about and apply in a productive way mm -hmm. in their careers absolutely i love that perspective on that and i mean as a two i totally related to that moment of like oh no the fear of being a bother and like the absolute like no i'll do anything ever to never bother anyone like and it really takes that like that work that processing of like let me reconnect with myself. What are the ways that I reframe this? What are the ways that I actually find the strength in what I'm doing? And I think sometimes I love the example that you were using too of that person reaching out to a friend because sometimes it's even like, what would you do if your friend came to you? You would be thrilled to help them. Like maybe there's sometimes we can give other people the gift of helping us. And that's, yes. that's in and of itself giving something. Yeah, but I love that. And you know, I know we don't have time to go into all the types, but I think it really connects a lot to, you know, common conversations I have with my ones and threes around like kind of that achievement in the workplace. And then the real devastation that comes from, well, I got that promotion. I got hired by my dream company. I've been working, working, working so hard for this. I finally got that big project and I am now in full on crisis because I'm so unhappy. I don't like this. Like what's happening? What's wrong with me that I'm not that person to do that? And you're absolutely right that it comes with that. How do we then explore like, well, what are your values? What is it? What, okay. The achiever side, that perfectionist side has been driving the car for a while now. Okay. Like you, you hit that apex of that achievement. So they kind of got to have a break from driving, but now who's in the driver's seat and where is everybody else in the car? And how do we rearrange and yeah, like reframe and, and re-examine instead of it being this black and white, it's all or nothing. Like I'm a helper or I'm a taker, I'm successful or I'm not, I'm a hard worker or now I'm suddenly lazy and what has happened to me? And it's like, yeah, where's, where's that exploration in the middle? Where is it that our identities are actually flexible and super complex because we're complex beings. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because I'm a, I'm a four and the basic fear for fours is that they don't have a strong identity and the desire is to be unique, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's so funny that I ended up before even like knowing all this Enneagram stuff, like I created a podcast in order to network like that. <laughs> like yeah. what a unique way, like I, <laughs> I'm going to be this unique person. It's just like. Okay, you can, and we can kind of laugh at ourselves a little mm -hmm. bit about these things. And I think yeah. that's really the beauty of a lot of this stuff yeah. is like, it doesn't have to be so serious. Our lives and our careers also mm -hmm. don't have to be so serious as melancholy and dramatic as a four can be, as I know I am. As, you know, <laughs> like, um, and like, you know, we, we can start to really understand, again, these patterns and and maybe not, again, we're not going to change ourselves, but we can understand and accept and then accept mm -hmm. what that means for our lives. Like I'm not a, let's say a three who's like a high achiever. I don't, when someone tells me that I've done a good job at my job, it means 
almost nothing to me. Like, mm-hmm. it's yeah. like, yeah. Martin, you're really good at, at what, or like, you know, you did a good job on the presentation. I'm like, so like, I just <laughs> like, don't even understand. But if someone goes, you meant a lot to me as a coach, I'm like, that's everything to me. Right. Yeah. So I'm never going to be the person with the biggest coaching company because mm-hmm. I just don't care about success yeah. metrics in that way. Right. I'm always going to be the person that's like trying to have that one-on-one relationship mm-hmm. that's unique and, and special to the person I'm working with. Mm-hmm. And I have to realize that about myself and then not get upset that I'm not like doing things that other people are doing. Cause that's really what right. we're trying to avoid is this constant comparison that we yes. do in our career yes. to people that are not us. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was you, I'd be you, right. If I, if I was yes. you, Robin, I'd be yes. doing Robin things. Yeah. And if you were me, you'd be doing Martin things. And yes. I think um, the problem is when I look at you and go, I should be doing Robin things. It's like, mm-hmm. no, I shouldn't, Right. you know, I should be doing Martin things. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, if we can take these tests and learn a little bit more about ourselves and accept those things about ourselves, um, you know, after taking this test, like a few months after taking it, um, I realized that like, because I like to be unique when I was in high school, I used to like draw on my clothes. Like I used to like do little custom things on my clothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that was fun. I haven't done that in like 20 years. And so I bought like a sewing machine and that does sewing and embroidery. And I do like little customizations on things that no one would even notice, but it's like, I know it's there and it makes me feel like it doesn't have to be like, go become some famous, like unique thing. It's like, no, it's just find what works for you. That makes Mm -hmm. you feel like you're you're living life according to your terms and in the way you, you feel comfortable with. And so as we go out and we do all these things, I, I, you know, I know we're getting towards the end here, but I wanted to circle back to the concept of shame and ask you how that plays into things. Cause so much of the job search in our careers, like even our success. I mean, I, we talk about this a lot about how a lot of success is actually just mental health issues. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you're the top of yeah. the company because you don't feel worthy. Um, and yeah. so um, <laughs> how does shame play into all this in your mind? Oh my gosh. I mean, I feel like this is it's so therapisty of me. I'm like, shame is like <laughs> so at our core, you know? And I think it's really interesting because I think it's like, um, the way that I like to frame shame, uh, mm-hmm. in, I don't know, going, going with some rhyming today. Um, but the way that I think it's helpful to frame that is really by describing these things as like productive versus unproductive guilt, because I think shame is distinctly in that category of unproductive guilt. Um, that it's like, it, it doesn't get us anywhere. Shame just makes us go, I'm bad. I'm a failure. There's nothing I can do. I'm not worthy. And it makes us retreat. It makes us go inward or it can have that opposite of like, oh, now I have to be the best at everything. And that is equally harmful in the other way, because now we are solely focused on I'm shoving that shame down and proving it wrong, but I'm doing that in a way that's not healthy either. Cause it's not connected to myself. It's not connected to other people. You know, it's very based in I'm ignoring everything that's happening. So I'm not actually really an empathic human functioning in the world if I'm only driven by avoiding shame. And so I think it's really helpful when we look at, you know, how do we use feelings of shame as productive guilt? And that's really when we can kind of evaluate what's happening. Like I, I always like to use kind of the visual of like, what's our decision tree, you know, that it's like, you know, here's, here's our thought. And it's like, okay, productive guilt or unproductive guilt. And it's like unproductive guilt is, oh, that comes from, you know, my family of origin, my culture, my religion, something where it's this distinctive commentary that is black and white, that it's, you should be this, or you shouldn't be that. And I don't fit perfectly into that mold. So I feel shame that I am not in that. And that is causing either the retreat or like the blind ambition kind of situation. Okay. We can like then follow that and sort of examine where that comes from, sort of help with those options of how can we, again, reframe that? How can we think about that differently? How can we place that differently? It doesn't mean you have to reject everything about where you came from, but it can be an important lens of, oh, this is how I was conditioned. Do I accept that conditioning now that I'm an adult and I have more power in my own life? 
okay, and, and what does that do? And obviously, what does that do to, within my family system, within my culture, like all of that? It's it's not a one and done conversation. That's a very delicate conversation that's going to be unique to every individual. And so I think it's like, that takes us down one road of exploration of like, how do we untangle that shame that really is unproductive guilt? And then the other side is, you know, how do we maybe transition it into productive guilt of, am I feeling shame because there was something within my control that I missed or wish I would do differently next time? And so I'm actually using this as a learning experience, even though it's sitting with me really uncomfortably, even though it's really hard for me to acknowledge or admit that I made that mistake or that I missed that thing. It's something I can learn from. It's something I can actually grow from or, um, it can even be, you know, that kind of thing of like, oh, that was like hurtful to somebody. Huh, I wasn't aware of that before. You know, any of those things where it really is like the shame comes up because it's a natural consequence to a realistic learning moment, as opposed to a commentary on who you are as a person and whether or not you're capable or incapable of doing something. So that's sort of where like, I think at a very, very basic level, I would say, I think I see shame playing a lot. And it really takes us in those two different directions of what are we exploring? How are we kind of untangling that ball of shame that can really just consume us? Because it feels like a, a black and white truth. And really it's not. It's a whole interwoven thing of like, what's the situation now? What is in my background that's contributing to this? What's happening? And we tease it apart. We can really start to figure out is it productive? Is it unproductive? And what do I do with that next? Like, what are my choices? I love that. And that reframe the shame, right? We got to figure out with all of these feelings, with all these experiences, what are we going to do with the information? Um, yes. And I've seen people take that information and go, you know, I just want a really quiet life that mm -hmm. has like a non-ambitious career that I get to go home at the end of the day and don't have yes. to think about. And they're incredibly happy now. Exactly. Like it doesn't have to end yes. with I'm CEO of a company. Like that's right. yeah. very rare. <laughs> like there's not that many CEOs. No. Um, uh, and, and I do think that, you know, with all of this stuff, I think our main message here is, you know, don't, don't put all of your eggs in the personality test ba basket, mm -hmm. but take what you can, take what you need, take what works and leave the rest. Mm -hmm. Kind of that yes. AA mindset, right? Take mm -hmm. what works yes. and leave the yes. rest. Yes. And uh, and I, I do, I want us to just end on one little fun thing. Um, do you know what your Hogwarts house is? I do. I'm, <laughs> what are I'm, you? Okay, so I am majority Hufflepuff with like a very close second of Gryffindor. So. <laughs> I'm Hufflepuff all day. <laughs> yes. I love a Hufflepuff. I have, I do have a, a Hufflepuff shirt. I'm not wearing it now. You know, I wasn't wearing it, but it is at home in my drawer. <laughs> hey, I'll take a proud Hufflepuff any day. I well, love thank it. you. So thank you so much for joining us today, Robin. Uh, this is really wonderful. And I hope it's a good starting point for people to begin their personality journey. And if anyone um, wants to follow more of your work or see what you're doing, where can they find you? Yes. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I completely agree. I hope this is a good jumping off point. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, the best place to find me is my website. It's robinmckenziemft.com. And um, my email is robin at robinmckenziemft.com. And I also have a contact me page on my website too. Wonderful. We'll go check it out and we'll have those links in the description. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Martin. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning into this episode. This was our 128th episode of the Career Therapy Podcast. And I wanted to just leave a little note at the end here to let you know about some of the things that are going on in the back end of what we're doing here. This will be the last episode that we post for a while as I'm currently in school studying to get my MSW, Master's in Social Work, in order to grow in my career and eventually become a therapist in addition to a career coach. What this means is that I'm going to be starting my internships. I'm in my second year of a three-year evening program. And with classes and internships and working, and everything else that's going on, um, I'm just going to be taking a break from the podcast at this time to focus that attention and that energy into some of the areas that need it 
a little bit more, uh, need a little bit more attention these days. If you are ever curious about what's going on with career therapy, we are still doing coaching. You can always head to careertherapy.com and learn more about the coaching options there or reach out to me on LinkedIn with questions or anything that's on your mind. Always here to help. But for the podcast, we'll be on hiatus until further notice. And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in and listening and sharing such great comments. I always get such nice messages from people on LinkedIn. Um, I don't think this is the end of the podcast. I do think I'll be back. I always get an itch to do more episodes eventually. Um, And, you know, we'll have future summer breaks and maybe an episode will come out here and there. So keep an eye out. But um, for now, this will be uh, a little bit of a, a pause on the Career Therapy Podcast. And I wish you all the best in your career journeys. And thank you again for for following along. You know, this isn't the end. We're still doing a lot of great things, but I just wanted to uh, say how much I appreciate you all and I'll see you in the future. Cheers.